Innovation Department here at the Block School at UMKC. And just want to welcome you all and welcome our faculty, our dean, our, our mentors, and other folks from the community coming to this event today. I think we have a good uh, panel in store for you. Uh, just to remind you, we do this on the first Wednesday of every month during the school semesters, uh, not in the summer and not during the holidays. And so put this on your calendar. It's a great event. We have a great speaker lineup. I'm going to turn it over to Andy Heiss, one of our manage managing directors in the Rainier Institute. And he's going to talk about uh, some of the things going on at the Rainier Institute. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, the first thing I'd like to um, make you aware of is the Entrepreneur Quest competition, or the EQ competition. This is the second year that we're running this competition. It takes place across the University of Missouri system. So uh, we have a competition on this campus, and the other three UM system campuses have a competition as well. And that culminates, uh, so we have a competition here, then that culminates next semester uh, with sort of a tournament style competition. You'll be competing against the other campuses. Uh, but as you can see, there's $60,000 of prize money uh, that, that, you could, um, that you could earn. Uh, and so if you're interested in this, at this point, all you need is an idea. You don't have to have a fleshed out business plan. You don't have to be up and running. All you have to do is have an idea. This semester, we're going to help you get that idea ready uh, to pitch towards the end of the semester, and then we'll select the top 10, top 10 teams to move on into the tournament uh, next semester. So right now, again, all you need is an idea. And if you're not sure what, what that means, uh, come to one of our informational meetings. They're happening every two weeks uh, starting on next Monday. If you can't... Um, Make those meetings. Uh, the first step you should take is go to that URL and enter your email address so you can get all the communications for that program. Uh, if you have other questions, you can find me afterwards, and I'm happy to answer those. The next thing I'd like to make you aware of is we're doing a field trip to Fishtech. Fishtech is a cybersecurity company located here in Kansas City. Uh, they have a brand new state-of-the-art facility, and the founder and CEO of that company was a 2016 recipient of uh, the Kansas City Entrepreneur of the Year Award. Uh, if you're interested in going to that, Friday, October 18th, uh, we, are, we, we can help you arrange transportation. Uh, if you can't get out there, uh, again, what you need to do is go to that URL right there and sign up and tell us that you're interested, and we'll make sure you get all of that information about the trip. So if you're interested at all in tech entrepreneurship, this is definitely something you should go to. Uh, next is the Student Entrepreneur of the Year Award. Um, there's a $2,500 scholarship associated with this. So if you are engaged in entrepreneurship, or if you have a friend who's engaged in entrepreneurship that you'd like to nominate, you can nominate yourself and your friend. We, we, both of you, that'd be fine. Uh, and. But the deadline to do so is October 4th. That's this Friday. Um, and if you're interested in doing that, just shoot us an email, entrepreneurship at umkc.edu. It's a great opportunity. Uh, we hold a big awards banquet in uh, November where you'll be honored, along with a lot of other, uh, some other Kansas City entrepreneurs. It is now my great pleasure to introduce you to Megan Darnell, who's the program manager at um, Fountain City FinTech. Megan is a 2018 Block MBA grad. Uh, yeah, she was also second place recipient of our RVCC competition, the Rainier Venture Creation Challenge, which you'll be hearing more about very soon. Uh, with her uh, family business um, in the avocado farming industry, yes. Uh, Megan was also president of the UMKC Enactus chapter, uh, went on to do great things, nationally ranked uh, that year. And she's now, as I said, the program manager for um, Fountain City FinTech. And so it's my pleasure to bring on the Baroness of Avocados in Kansas City, <laughs> Megan Darnell. ask if um, our founders want to come up on 
stage. I'll talk for a little bit, but the fun part will when, is when you guys are going to talk. So, like Andy said, my name's Megan Darnell. Um, what I do at Fountain City is I kind of manage the program, hence the name program manager. But um, it, it entails a bunch of different things. Um, I could bore you with the bank fintech details, but what I hope to get out of tonight is really focusing on you guys, the students, um, making tonight about how best we can kind of talk and answer questions that really relate to you in the present moment. So as these founders kind of tell their stories and their journeys, please feel free to poke, prod, ask questions, and the founders all kind of put the onus on you as well um, as you talk about kind of how you started your entrepreneurial journeys. Um, do it through the lens of what you wish you would have known in college or um, kind of parting advice or wisdoms um, that they could kind of run with on their own. Um, for me, I'll start since I'm definitely the most boring person up here. I got into the entrepreneurial world through an active, actually. It just kind of fell bass backwards into it. Um, started taking on a couple different projects, realized I really liked building things. After undergraduate, I um, went on to work with our family business in the avocados, like Andy said, was living in Mexico. I was taking um, classes at a local university, trying to learn Spanish, taught English on the side, and then really learned the world of supply chain, vertical integration, family business, and Mexican avocados. So if you ever want to get weird with like some guacamole, let me know. I'm your girl. Um, that kind of ended up me going back to Kansas City to get the um, formalized education in entrepreneurship. So I did it through skinning my knees um, and trying to build things, but I wanted to come back and really get um, a, a take on it through the academic lens. That's where I got, got my MBA here, did international business and entrepreneurship, very relevant when you're working with Mexican avocados. Uh, got back into Enactus, and Ben was the one who introduced me to the world of FinTech. Um, there are few things more impactful than having kind of a professor in your life that understands what you want to get out of a future career and what you're really passionate about and then can make those connections in the real world. So Ben was able to put me in touch with Zach, who is our managing director, and that's where this whole thing started. Uh, we're in our second cohort, so these three wonderful humans are part of that crazy experience. And if you're not familiar with an accelerator model, it's very similar to a boot camp. Um, we have e-scholars here, which is a form of an accelerator model. What we do is we take in young startup companies and we try and give them all the necessary equipment to scale their business and um, be more profitable, beneficial, um, hyper-focused after the fact. So we can kind of, I think, kick it off from there. Uh, Susie, I'd love to get your take first, just because through this lens of um, kind of working around the college student, I mean, what better way to start than your story of actually incepting Pluto in college for college students? Um, I'll kick it off to you then. If you wanna just kind of share your journey, um, what led to Pluto, and then maybe explain to everybody kind of what Pluto is and how best they could get involved with it. Yeah, sounds good. So my name is Suzy. I'm co-founder and CXO of Pluto Money. Um, my journey goes way back to when I was born and raised um, so I was born in Korea and raised in Saudi Arabia from my dad's work. Um, we traveled a, ro a lot around uh, that time I was growing up in Saudi Arabia. So I grew up kind of immersed in cultures in Africa, Middle East, and Asia, and that really opened up my eyes. And then I realized that, oh, I was growing up in very suppressive countries in terms of tradition and gender equality. And I wanted to do something about it since I was very young. At the same time, my uncle was a net geo photographer documenting um, like minority cultures that was disappearing in Tibet, Nepal, Himalayan areas. So when I was growing up, I was like, okay, I wanna do something that's very impact driven. I wanna help the minorities however I can. So when I turned 12, I told my parents that it was time for me to leave Korea quit middle school and go out to the world and live somewhere else. 
and of course my parents were very against that. Um, so I went on a hunger strike for two weeks. I was banging pots and pans in front of my parents' door at 5.30 in the morning every day. I was like, I gotta go to America. I'm gonna go to school there. Um, well, the real reason there was that I wanted to play soccer and the boys at my school wouldn't let me play soccer because I was a girl. And I was like, well, this is a bullshit. I've seen, <laughs> I've seen girls playing soccer when I went to summer camps in Chicago, so I'm gonna go and do that. So my parents agreed to send me um, with some clauses attached, like um, you're gonna go there for one year, you're gonna come back, finish high school, and when you go to college, you can do whatever you want to. And that was agreement, but it turned out that America back then had some sort of age limit for public school. So at 12, I wasn't allowed to come here and attend public schools by myself as an exchange student. So I ended up on an island in Canada where I spent a year. So if you look at Canadian map, it's a rectangle, and then there's something sticking out on the right, and then there's a dot. So I was on that dot for a year. <laughs> And I didn't know how to speak English. And that school, nobody has seen an Asian before in like six mile radius of the town. So everyone knew my name on the first day, wrong. And <laughs> they didn't have anything like an English as a second language program. I was thrown into like a regular ninth grader um, academic courses, learning biology and astronomy and English, a language that I didn't understand. Anyways, after one year of surviving, I got a gold medal from the school for being like top one percentile with my grades. I dangled it in front of my parents, made a lot of negotiations and ended up in an upstate New York boarding school. Um, right between high school and college, when I was applying to colleges, my dad really wanted me to go to Emory University in Atlanta because his company had a partnership with the university where if I attended there, they would pay 50% of the tuition as a scholarship. Um, so I committed to the university, rejected all the other schools, and between that time that I committed to the school and actually went to the college, my dad suddenly passed. Um, it was like stage four cancer. We had two months with him. And of course, right before I went to the school, the company canceled on the scholarship. And it turned out that that university was one of the most expensive colleges in America that year. So my tuition as an international student for a year was $60,000. And my mom, a public school art teacher, and a single mom suddenly didn't have a lot of savings. And I had to watch her sell the house that my dad built for us for one year of school. And that year was just really difficult. And after that year, I was just like, this is not worth it. Education is not worth this much. So I quit school altogether, packed up everything, went back to Korea with zero plans of continuing my education. I was working five part-time jobs and taking classes from three different online schools. And one year later, I convinced my mom to take out a loan to invest in a business together. We bought a space that was going out of business from being a cafe. I wanted to build her like a retirement plan, a ceramic studio, which was what she loved doing. And the guy that was going out of business used to run a cafe and he was burned out of the business. He was like, you guys can keep all the equipment, sell it, do whatever you want to. So we were like, we like coffee, we like going to cafes. So we'll combine this into like cafe slash ceramic studio. So that's what we started doing. I learned how to roast coffee and the roasting side started doing really well. We became a franchise business within a year. We had four store locations and with that money, I was able to come back here to continue my education. So by the time I transferred to UCLA in 2013, um, I had transferred through six different colleges. And when I got to UCLA, I was an art history and Italian major. I wanted to move to Italy and become an art marketer and live in Europe for the rest of my life. And there was this amazing program at UCLA that sends students to London to study art marketing for three months and then to Florence for nine months to study art and culture. And I was like, this is it, this is amazing. This is my future laid out in front of me. I'm gonna go do that and stay in Italy for the rest of my life. But five days before moving to Europe, I pulled out of the program because I had a panic attack. I was like, what if I can't afford to live in Europe for a year? How am I gonna do that? What if I get into another student that what if I can't come back and graduate on time this time again? 
I had no idea how much I had saved. I had a checking account, but I didn't know the difference between checking and savings account. I didn't know what credit meant. I didn't know how to start building credit. And with all of those stress piling up all of a sudden, I pulled out of the program. And that summer was maybe the lowest point in my life because I had just let go of my dream and I had no idea what to do. I didn't have anything else lined up. Like I, my stuff was all in a storage box. My lease had ended, I didn't have anywhere to live. So I called my best friend who was interning at Expedia in Seattle over the summer. And I was like, hey, can I come out and stay on your couch for three months? And he was like, sure. So I stayed on at his intern housing apartment for three months, watching him make a ton of money as a tech intern. And he was just blowing through it all. He was making $30 an hour and he was dropping 30 bucks on dinner every day thinking, I'll make up for this in an hour. He went to EDC, like he took me to Vegas and just like, <laughs> Um, flew through it all, and after the summer, he didn't have a dime saved, and his mom was really angry at him. So after the summer, we were sitting on a couch like, why are we so bad with money? And that was a time when millennial was a huge thing, all the media was dubbing us the generation that can't manage our money, the splurge generation, and I was starting to get angry. Like, no one taught us how to manage our money. I was looking at my friends that was all graduating without knowing how to handle taxes, how to negotiate income, how to start saving for retirement, what the difference between all the retirement accounts were. And I was like, well, no one's teaching us, no one's trying to help us, and everyone's kind of getting pushed out of school and expected to start adulting. So that's how I started Pluto. Um, I wanted to help college students not have to let go of their dreams for financial reasons anymore. And I started that company with my co-founder, who was that same best friend, and he's sitting right there. <laughs> um, so that's my story of <laughs> founding Pluto. It was all because of my financial struggles during college. And right now, our vision is to build a financial wellness platform for Gen Z college students and grow up with them for a lifetime and help them um, save for the goals that matter to them and reach financial wellness. <laughs> I love your story because it talks to something that like I think all of us were like viscerally shaking our heads that we weren't taught how to manage money properly and you don't realize that until you're already in the thick of it um, which you then turned into a wonderful company Pluto Money. Um, I wanted you to go first because I knew we were going to touch on part of your amazing story. Honestly, guys, like the first time we all heard Susie's story, we talked about it afterwards as if it were like a movie. I mean, she has such a wonderful life story. It is, it's so inspirational. Um, but when you had tried to go back into college and realize just that tuition is astronomically more expensive than anyone realizes. And I know I felt that pain. I know, Tony, you especially felt that pain. Um, that kind of segue hopefully will set you up to explain how you got to Chipper, the journey along the way, and um, another one of my absolute favorite stories. Yeah. Hey, guys. On. Um, I'm Tony Aguilar. I'm founder and CEO of Chipper. Um, my story is a little different than Susie's. Um, I grew up in West Texas. Anybody from Texas in here? Oh, right. Yeah, all right. We got a few. Annabelle, Annabelle yeah, you don't count. Um, so I grew up in a small town called Pecos. Um, the town was so small that you had to ask your parents um, if you wanted to date somebody just to make sure you guys weren't related. Um, true story. True story. Uh, but I grew up pretty humbled. I was the first in my family to graduate from high school, uh, the first to go to college. Um, and I was blessed to have parents that really just pushed me, you know, like, you're going to college. Like, I don't care where you go whether it's junior college, somewhere in Texas, or, or Harvard. Um, and I'm glad that they kind of, you know, pushed me to go get an education uh, to, to help get out of, of where I grew up. Um, and I ended up going to school in uh, Indiana. So I went to IU. Um, and I didn't realize at the time um, that, you know, if you go to an Ivy League school, you actually don't have to really pay anything. Like, I saw the tuition was way higher. And I got into a couple Ivies, Ivy League schools. But uh, back then, I, I looked a little different. I dressed a little different. I talked a little different. Um, and I just didn't think I would fit in, so decided not to go because of tuition bill, but also try, like fitting in. 
Um, so we ended up going to IU, and out-of-state tuition was, was $30,000 a year. Um, that didn't include room and board, you know, um, rent, like all the other things you guys know you have to pay for. And so I had to finance almost every penny to go to college, you know, because my, my parents couldn't help. And I came out of school with over 100 k in student loan debt. And so, you know, after that, um, I actually went and played poker for a living for a little bit after. Um, my mom doesn't like me to tell that part of the story. Um, but played poker for a little bit, and then she was like, all right, you need to grow up and, and go do something, like use your degree. Um, so then I became a financial advisor. Um, and at, the, at this time, as I was trying to, you know, build up my practice in my career, you know, my student loan payments were over $1,200 a month. And so, you know, that, that was more than my, my rent in Austin. Um, I ended up moving back to Austin, back to Texas. Um, and, you know, I just got, I was really just pissed off, honestly. I was like, I did all the right things. Like, I, I got good grades, went to good college, I have a good job, but I'm like, I still can't even survive, right? I, I can barely pay my, my bills. I was like, this American dream that my parents pushed me to go after, like, it's not true, it's not real. Um, and then I started talking to a lot of friends around me, and they were struggling through the same thing. Um, so... In 2013, I ended up launching a company called Student Loan Genius, uh, which allowed companies to pay down student loan debt for their employees. Um, and at the time, as a financial advisor, I saw that all my clients, you know, they, they had, they were working with these great companies who would match their 401k contributions, but they couldn't afford to do it. And so I was like, these companies have allocated the money to put this in their retirement account, but they're not using it. It's just sitting on their balance sheets. What if we could go grab that money and apply towards student loan debt instead? And everybody thought I was crazy for even trying to consider a company to do this. And so over four years, you know, built this company from scratch, from an idea on a plane, uh, to raising over $7 million from some of the, the biggest investors in the country, uh, Prudential, John Hancock, k Capital. Um, I personally closed, you know, Fortune 500 companies like MasterCard, um, New York Life, Pinterest, Twilio, some incredible companies. Um, so we, we really just catalyzed that entire, uh, that entire industry. And now... Um, about 5 to 6% of all companies in the entire country now offer student loan benefit. So super proud of, of, building, yeah, of building that up. Um, and it was awesome. It's like we scaled this company. We raised a ton of money. I got invited to the White House to go hang out with President Obama and tell him what we're doing. You just, just had this incredible experience. Um, and, you know, that lasted for, you know, like I said, four years. And then one day, Two days after, uh, after Christmas, I'm back in the office working because that's what I do. You know, everybody had off, and half the team was there. Half the team was hustling. And then my board calls a meeting at the last second. I was like, all right, what, what's this about? It's, it wasn't a big surprise we had done that before. And so I get pulled into a conference room, and uh, one of the board members was there. The, the rest were on the phone. And then they call the meeting to order, and then um, they push me out of the company. Um, so something that I had started, built from scratch, um, I was essentially fired. I, like, I had to give them my laptop and my keys and everything for my own company. And then I had to go home uh, to where my, my, my in-laws were and tell them that I just got fired from my own company. And like, they had no idea how startups work. So they're like, what are you talking about? Like, you started this whole, this is your company. Like, how do you get fired? Uh, but at the time, I went through just a huge, huge burnout. I um, mean, I didn't realize it. I was like the only person that didn't realize it. Um, so... Took some time off and, you know, just spent time with the family, um, kind of got my stuff together, and then I started having dreams about student loans again. Um, it's, I know it's weird. I, you guys dream about other things. I dream about student loans. Um, I was telling Annabelle the exact, like, scenario, and she thought I was crazy. Um, no, but really, like, then I started to dive in. I was like, okay, I, want, I, I set out to go solve this problem, but only about 5% of people have access to this. You know, what, you know, what could I go build to actually help everybody with student loan debt? And so... Um, I saw all this cool stuff that was happening in the savings and investing world, right? Like Acorns had come out, Stash had come out, uh, Robinhood had come out, like all these apps that were just helping people save and invest. I was like, what if we took a lot of those cool things that are happening on that side but applied it towards student loan debt instead? And so at Chipper, you know, what we've built um, is a tool that helps people, one, make the smartest decision when it comes to their student loans. So for those of you in the room that have student loans, you know that you don't have one loan, right, for your entire college career. On average, you guys are going to come out with about a dozen loans. Like, I had 18. And you're going to end up paying two or three or four different services. And there's over 150 different repayment programs that exist. And so for you to figure out, like, what do I qualify for, it's difficult because, um, I hate to say it, the schools don't help. Other finance apps just show you all your debt in a pretty graph. Um, and, you know, there's really no tools out there to help. So at Chipper, we're actually, um, while I was sitting over there, I got the notification that we got the push out. So um, this feature is coming out here in the next like week or so where you just link your loans and we show you which programs that you qualify for. 
You'll then be able to make your full payments through our app, so you'll never have to deal with Sally Mae or Navient or any of the terrible servicers again. And then we built really cool tools to help you chip away the debt faster, hence the name Chipper. Um, so like roundups, so think acorns, but for student loans. You link your cards, and every time you, you purchase something, we round up the transaction and send the change off to your student loan debt. Uh, Chipper Pool, you can invite family and friends with a simple link. Send it to grandma. Grandma can shoot you 50 bucks, or she can pay $100 per month, like whatever she wants to do. Um, and then next year, we're working on launching a debit card uh, where every time you swipe, you get a uh, cash back towards your student loans. It also has a rewards layer where brands will also kick back money towards your student loan debt for shopping with them. So like our whole goal is to just transform the way that people experience and, and pay off their student loan debt. And last but not least, um, Donald, one of the things I, I hope you touch on as we kind of look through it um, with the, the student focus lens is your motto, which is why I saved you for last, because I think these are two shining examples of the idea behind C1B1. And um, I think, I know I get inspired every time I hear the story of just kind of how you even began to formulate the idea of being an entrepreneur. And like Tony, you're a CEO entrepreneur, so kind of the journey through all of those businesses. And then maybe we can uh, talk a little bit about SDK bank integration on, on what Griffin is. Perfect, thank you. First off, shout out to that guy. I saw him running uh, when I was pulling in and that's dedication. You made it here, bro. You're the real MVP. Can we get a clap for that, please? This guy, he's working out. Uh, so my story, uh, I started, uh, started, it was a, a balmy Thursday when my dad met my mom. Uh, joking. I grew up in a small little town in South Georgia called Albany. Uh, anybody from Georgia here? Let's keep that going. <laughs> Alabama, Florida. Uh, uh, all right, there, all right, we'll, we'll take it. Georgia adjacent? We'll take it. Uh, super small little town. Um, uh, had an amazing childhood growing up. Uh, middle class family. Uh, my origins really, really neat. My father was the first black person to integrate his high school because my grandmother was crazy and felt he was strong enough to just do it, and she was a troublemaker. And uh, he made it through. My grandmother was a sharecropper. And I like to typically start off my origin story with that because my sisters and I didn't touch any of that. Meaning my mom and dad did such a good job, they leveled us up like to an insane degree. Uh, Went through life like any other normal kid. Uh, in 1994, my hometown got flooded and the beautiful Mayberry town that I grew up loving uh, all started to spiral downhill. Factories started to close, the housing market was a mess. I had family members that had to move to other states to follow the company, it was crazy. And uh, I was a 12 year old boy looking at my dad in the face, seeing the fear that he had with five kids and a wife not knowing if his company was going to be the next one to close. It was, it was nuts. Uh, things stabilized a little bit, and a couple years later, my dad got this new 26-year-old boss named Jameer Jackson. He played basketball at Notre Dame, got drafted by the Bulls, blew out his knee, and ended up getting a job with Procter & Gamble, and for some unknown reason, ended up in Albany, Georgia at one of their many plants. And he was the coolest thing on earth to me since like sliced bread, it was amazing. I mean, the guy's a basketball player. Uh, he had the coolest little Debbie snacks at his house. We used to eat a lot. Uh, that was one really cool thing about Jameer. Uh, but this thing called the internet started, and I'm really about to give away my age, uh, <laughs> in middle school for me. And he had the first computer I'd ever seen in person. And not only did he have a computer, he started this thing called an entrepreneurial business. And I'm sitting there like, what does he do? He started a drop shipping company. So by day, he was my father's boss, uh, the VP of accounting at a Procter & Gamble plant. And in the evening, he ran this drop shipping business where people back then, it was too expensive to build websites, so they would send him their figurines and books. He would store them in his closet, sell it, ship it, keep part of the profit. I saw him go in his part-time from a closet in his house to a uh, small shed in his backyard to a warehouse. and. Uh, I just started, I was in love, I was done. There was no way I was gonna ever work a corporate job after that, because he was making more money with his side business than he was as my dad's boss at Procter & Gamble. So uh, 
I did like all of us do. Um, I went to college and completely lost touch uh, with him. Uh, moved to Atlanta. Uh, also racked up a lot of student loans. And I also wasted a lot of money uh, as well. Uh, and then I got another break. Um, because of the time uh, that I was in college, websites were very expensive to build. And my friends and I decided that we would build websites for dentists. So we used this tool called Microsoft Front Page. Anybody know Front Page in the room? Show your hands. It's OK. Doesn't show really what the age is, but Front Page was just it's horrible. You might want to look it up, and you'll laugh. It's, it's bad. You just paste pictures together, and it just works. Uh, <laughs> and we were charging doctors five to eight grand a pop. So me and my college roommates were like, dude, this, is, this feels like a Ponzi scheme, but <laughs> we're making so much money. We're the beer guys uh, after we got to 21 years old in college. Uh, yeah, moving on. So uh, we found out through that process that doctors did not know how to market and advertise. And we created a website uh, back then called Doctor Phone Book. We charged doctors 100 bucks per month. They got a profile page. Google AdWords was really cheap. So it was like 12 cents a click. And we took 20 bucks from every uh, subscription that we had. They got a lot of business. And I had a meeting with our top customers, an orthodontist who had uh, seven practices and seven profile pages uh, on our platform. And we had lunch. He slid me a napkin and said, I will pay you $170,000 a year to shut the site down. And I sent the nicest thank you but now we're done letter or email to all of our clients the next day because I was an idiot and did not see the future. So shut the site down, uh, called my mom and dad, said, hey, I made it, I've arrived, all that other good stuff. So I, I felt $170,000, I, I was set for life, no kid. So I did all the stupid things that people do back then. I bought two houses, had three cars, and took a lot of trips and just blew all of it. And uh, I hated working for the guy. Uh, I mean, he was the absolute worst possible boss to work for, and I'm thankful every day for that because I learned everything not to do in business by working with him. Uh, my dad called me one day and was like, you're making a lot of money. At that point, I'm now over $200,000. We went from seven locations to 15, uh, and I was really just sticking around because the guy was such a jerk to the employees. And my dad was like, you make a lot of money from one orthodontist. It's like, yeah. He was like, aren't there a lot of orthodontists? Light bulb went off. I quit the same day. Started an ad agency where we focused on healthcare marketing and advertising. I ended up making the same amount of money in six months than I did with that guy in a year. And uh, I was like, great, feeling good. Started making some really small micro investments in people from my hometown. Uh, my best friend's sister, when I talk about my life, I just think about how crazy it is. Uh, my best friend's sister called me and asked me if I wanted to buy a magazine. Uh, told her, no, I'm not that crazy. She mailed me a copy. Magazine looked pretty good. Ended up buying the magazine. <laughs> Started four more magazines. Found out the company was based in Kansas City, actually at uh, 435 in Metcalf. Uh, and at that time, I had the most magazines in the country for that company. And they asked me to come to Kansas City and become their national sales director. Told them no. Um, they asked more. Uh, it took us about three, four months before I decided to say yes. And the reason I did was because they agreed to allow me to build a digital platform uh, based off of what they'd done with print. I moved here, uh, moved to Leewood, uh, and a year passed and nothing happened. We hadn't even touched the digital side of things. And I had my one year meeting with the CEO and was like, hey bro, it's been a year, what's up? And he was like, we really want to focus on print. It's like, cool, I quit. And a few months later, I started this, uh, this company called City Smart. I'm going to tell you guys all about Alex. I'm joking. It's in a good way. So uh, City Smart uh, was a community as a service app that uh, I put together. We aggregated tons of data from the community, traffic, news, weather, a directory of businesses. We gave it to consumers for free. And so that was the original concept. We charged businesses a monthly fee to push notifications and get listed, blah, blah, blah. I raised a little money. Uh, applied to Techstars. Alex was very nice when she told me no. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I went down to Austin, Texas, got accepted into another program. And the first day I got there, they were like, Donald, we love you, but man, your business model sucks. Day one. So I'm like, all right, back to the drawing board. We got connected to Capital One while I was down there. Um, and we started kicking some ideas around. 
about creating a tool that gave any type of business the ability to geofence physical locations. Our company would collect those location insights and figure out some stuff from there. So uh, I did demo day, got back to Kansas City. So this was last November. Uh, one of our buddies connected me to Zach Pettit. I went to go meet with Zach. And when you guys get to know Zach, you know, he does this pretzel cross his legs thing. And, and when he's really not interested, he'll lean back and kind of do this. <laughs> and fortunately for me, something I said struck. And he goes, wait a minute. If you could geofence homes for sale, we'd be interested. So I'm like, all right. So I started doing some digging. Uh, towards the beginning of this year, got the ball rolling, and uh, came up with this concept called Griffin Technologies. Uh, Zach and his team at NBKC and Megan created this uh, entrepreneur residence program that I was lucky to be a part of. And essentially what we provide is banks a software developer kit or an SDK that they embed in their mobile app. And we then allow these same banks to create geofences around any physical location. So homes for sale, auto dealerships, other banks, Whole Foods, whatever you could imagine. If and someone doesn't know what a geofence is? A force field. <laughs> geofence is a magical force field that exists around all of us, like the force. It's very similar to the force. Uh, there's only good ones. There's only, uh, there are some bad geofences. We'll talk offline about that. There are some bad geofences. Uh, so when consumers go into an open house, we now inform the bank that their customer might be interested in buying a home. Uh, so we have a couple of different features that we offer uh, with geolocation. Uh, and also as part of my journey here in Kansas City, uh, I was able to start an uh, entrepreneur platform uh, called KC Collective. And it's just a bunch of startups and entrepreneurs here in town. We get together three times per month and we share resources and we got over a million dollars in perks that any entrepreneur in Kansas City can get access to completely free of charge. Uh, so 200,000 off Amazon Web Services, 20K off uh, Stripe processing fees, 90% off HubSpot, blah, blah, blah. And uh, yeah, that is my story. Did I miss something? So now that you've heard from these wonderful humans, um, I want to open it up for questions. One of my favorite mottos is what's most personal is most universal. So feel free to ask pointed questions. We really want this to be beneficial to you guys. Um, I can see Salim and Ali coming up to grab the like, test, test. party microphones. Um, before you throw those into the crowd, like beach balls? Is this what's gonna happen? Yeah. Um, I wanna make uh, two points really quickly. First and foremost, uh, I wanna make sure that you guys are all invited to our Fountain City FinTech Demo Day. Come support these guys. Come check out more about what we do at Fountain City FinTech. It is October 15th, um, 6 to 8 p.m. out at MBKC Bank, which is the bank which we're located in, their headquarters. We are running a banner ad on Startland, so startland.com. If you click on that, that's probably the easiest way to get it. Otherwise, come see me, Ben, the Enactus kids. They all know kind of how to get it. Mm -hmm. Is it startlandnews.com? MBKC, so uh, yeah. <laughs> It, it used to stand for National Bank of Kansas City, but it doesn't anymore, fun fact. So uh, we just go by something that it means nothing. Uh, <laughs> okay, before, before questions, the second point. I want to make sure that they can get a hold of you guys. What is the best way for them to connect with you? Uh, you can find me on uh, LinkedIn. Uh, also Twitter, my Twitter handle is that guy Donald, he's so fly, he's so fly, like me. Is that, is that really it? No, no, Please it, say that's real. It's, it's uh, I think Twitter, I'm, I'm at Don J. Hawkins. LinkedIn for me, um, open to public. If you're a college student looking for jobs, connections, mentorships, I'm wide open, so reach out to me, message me, ask me all the questions. That's yeah. Susie Kim with Pluto Money. Yeah, again, Tony Aguilar, um, that's my handle on Twitter, and um, yeah, hit me up on LinkedIn as well. Thanks, guys. If you have a question, just raise your hand. Uh, me and Allie will come give you the block, two at a time. Test, test, all right. For Tony, were you able 
to recoup any of the funds from your company? Did you sue? How did that work out or anything? <laughs> Going right for it. Going right for it. Um, Got to be careful here. <laughs> um, yeah, the company and I did get into lawsuits for a couple months, back and forth. Um, you, yeah, um, so, we, so we got into lawsuits back and forth. We ended up settling. Um, and upon part of the settlement agreement, um, I agreed not to steal any of our teammates, steal any customers, steal um, anybody else. And also, like, I, I didn't want to. Like I just wanted to make sure that my my stock was protected. Like I was still I'm still the biggest shareholder of the company, and so I just want I didn't want to affect that, and so um, because of that I didn't want to ruin the company. Right? I worked so hard to get it to where it was at. Like I, I, I'm still the biggest cheerleader of Student Loan Genius, which is now Vault and everything they're doing. And so yeah, I mean just that's just a natural situation where you typically go into into lawsuits and um, you know try to find you know middle ground that works on both sides. And we were able to do that. Just just took a little while. Yeah, I mean, to, just to prevent it from happening, um, I would say, you know, as, as you start building a, a startup, you start to get, you know, you, you have your advisors and you start to build out your board. Um, your board um, is essentially your boss, right? Um, and, you know, like any boss, you want to make sure you're doing all the right things, that you guys are on the same page, that you, you know, you're impressing them. Um, and I did a terrible job of managing my board, meaning setting expectations. And so, when I, when, looking in hindsight, when things were going fantastic, like things were going awesome, like it was like everyone's high-fiving around the table, right? But when, you know, stuff got hard or, you know, like stuff was just happening, you know, like in, in our market or within the company, um, they were like, well, Tony made a bad decision, right? It wasn't like, hey, we did this together. And so, just learning how to actually manage your board and make sure that, like, hey, all the decisions that we make, all the strategies that we put in place, um, that I get buy-in from everybody, you know, and, like individually and then as a group in the meeting and everybody signs off on it, right? And so that if things are going well, we all celebrate together. If things are going hard, we try to figure it out like as a team. And so that's the biggest piece of advice is just managing your board and making sure that, you know, you're setting expectations that you guys are on the same page. Thank you. All right. Um, did all three of you guys start with co-founders? So I, Student Loan Genius, um, I, my first investor was somewhat of my co-founder, but he wasn't that operational. But I ended up hiring, um, bringing on a, a co-founder with me. With Chipper, I was a, I'm, I'm a solo founder. Yeah, like I said, I started the company with my best friend, who was also my roommate, and we were in a co-ed entrepreneurship fraternity together. So we, I like really knew the guy. Um, so we started it together. Neither of us had a technical background, so. Um, a year later, we ended up getting a third co-founder and CTO, Dante. Um, he's still with the team, and he's supposed to be a college senior right now, but he's on a leave from school to work with us full time. So that's the three of us. And I'm a single co-founder. Okay. Well, technically, founder. Can't be a co-founder. Single, right? But, and I will say, like, if it's your first venture, get some co-founders. It's too hard. It's way too hard. Um, and if you can, someone do the business side, someone do the technical side. So a follow-up question to that. I'm sorry. Go ahead. But be very careful also on the tech side. So one thing that I've learned, uh, a lot of ventures, especially the biz dev founder, everybody that knows tech knows more than us typically at that stage. And I've seen a lot of founders give up too much to somebody that might be a junior developer that is still leaps and bounds more tech enabled than a biz dev founder. So also be very careful about you can make that person a co-founder, but also make sure that you have language that gives you all the ability to kind of walk things back. Because as your company starts to scale, another person has 40% equity, you know, in the company, and you realize, crap, this dude's junior level at best, but we need a couple seniors. That's a hard price to pay, you know, when you want to start recruiting some legit developers. Yeah. So how did you go on to kind of like assess the co-founders and like have those conversations that like you know they're a good fit, basically. Yeah, so for Dante, well, I'll, I'll start with the story about Sam. Like we knew that 
the two of us were on the opposite end of the spectrum when it came to financial struggles as college students, but we were all on the same page that we wanted to work on this mission together. With Dante, he initially joined the team as an intern. We had an Angelus posting um, saying we were looking for a lead developer or like developer intern. He reached out and he was a rising sophomore in college. He didn't really have a previous job experience, but he had been coding since middle school. He was just like one of those genius guys. Um, so we invited him as an intern and he started from there. We were working with him on a day-to-day -day basis, making sure that he was not only like really good with his coding, but also really dedicated into the mission and like really bought in um, to what we were working on. And we offered him co-foundership like seven, eight months later. So my advice is that when you're looking for a co-founder, never advertise that you're looking for a co-founder. Always say that you're looking for like a head of something or like a lead something. There's always a way to promote them, but once you invite them as a co-founder, you can't demote that person. It's really difficult. So um, give them a chance to prove themselves and make sure that they're all aligned with you and are the right fit for your company. Yeah, that's an interesting point. Like, so the person I brought on as my co-founder, I ended up having to demote him uh, so he was head of product for us, but as we scaled SLG, like um, you know, the, the company outgrew him essentially, and so I it was it was the toughest conversation I've ever had. Where it's like, hey, I have you, I'm hiring a boss over you. That was really really tough. Um, so I, I mean, I, I think you need to spend a lot of time with whoever you think is going to come on to lead any part of your team. Uh, like at the beginning, just getting to know them, like seeing how they work. And it's okay to do projects. Like there's no rush to find a co-founder. Like you need to spend time to make sure this is the person that's going to stick with you, you know, through the thick and thin. But when it comes to, you know, more employees and stuff, it's e easier to hire faster and then fire faster. But co-founder, you know, that person that's going to be next to you, like it, it's okay to spend a couple of months vetting them to make sure like that's the person you want to you essentially marry in your business. Thank you. The last thing I'll add to the co-founder one is just making sure that in school you almost feel like you need to get tutored and, and brush up on the subjects that you're not good on, but you and your co-founders potentially need to really understand like this is my niche, this is exactly where my strengths lie and this is where your strengths lie and you need to balance one another as you kind of grow and, and, and learn and build that culture and vision and everything else, but I think that's perfect. Okay, this is for Susie. Um, first of all, I want to say uh, big applause to you for being able to push through your struggles. Um, and the reason why I say this is being an international student, I understand what you're talking about because I'm an international student. Um, I've gone through like financial issues and I'm also going through it. I actually dropped out for a semester and came back to MKC, so I know what you're talking about. Um, with that being said, I want to ask this question. How were you able to push through? How were you able to um, be able to pay up the, the tuition? How were you able to, what kept you going in those times when it seemed like nothing is gonna work out? Um, and then secondly, uh, I wanna ask, what was it like being able to uh, start your own company? Because I know being from a different country, your parents want you to be a doctor, a lawyer, or this or that. How were you able to push through those limits and say, I'm gonna do something different? Um, that is my own way, so. Yeah, so the first question, that's a good question. I don't know what motivated me so much to push through to keep like continuing my education. Um, I just knew that I always, always wanted to go back to school. I always knew that like my best chance at meeting the best people, building my network and building my skill sets was in school. Um, so like. To this date, I still want to go back to school. Like even though I'm graduated, I'm always looking for better like learning opportunities. Like, can I like continue with some like executive programs or masters or like whatever it is? Like, can I go back to school? Because I know that like having been to like six different colleges, I know that like being in school is one of the best ways to like meet the right like-minded people, learn everything you want to. Like in school, when you're in school, it comes with a lot of benefits. Like if you're a student reaching out to a random stranger for mentorship, they're much more likely to help you out, mm -hmm. um, lend a helping hand. And yeah, like you gotta take a lot of advantage of like being in school. Um, so for me, like 
I didn't really know that at the time. I just knew that I wanted to be in school, be surrounded by like all the classes and teachers and students. Um, so I kept like making my way back into school, whether it was like through online schools, community colleges. Um, I've been to like Ivy Leagues. I've been to like uh, regular four-year public schools. Um, and for your second question, sorry, can you repeat the question again? Yes, um, I hope I remember the question. Um, I think my my question was, uh, how were you able to break the barrier of um, what your parents want you to do, either be a doctor or a lawyer? How were you able to say, I'm going to do what I want and I'm going to push it through regardless? <laughs> so I actually have an interesting story. So I shared that I wanted to do like an impact related work. And my way of doing that initially when I was a kid was becoming a surgeon. Okay. I wanted to go to medical school, become a surgeon. I wanted to join the army and go to war zones. And that was my idea of like helping people. So when I was in high school, my school was so small. We had 60, college, 60 kids total and we didn't have enough classes for everyone. So I went out to Cornell, my high school was at a part of Cornell University, so I went out to Cornell, sourced professors myself. I was like, hey, can you come out to my school and teach me this class? And I'll form a class for you, we can design it together. And I was lucky enough to find two professors who actually came out to my school once a week to like teach a class that was designed for me. Like, I was learning um, like advanced chemistry, like all of those like classes required for med school. So. By the time I graduated from high school, I met all of the requirements for like pre-med classes um, in college. So I was going to become a surgeon, but my mom was really against it. She was against me becoming a surgeon as a woman. She was against me joining the army. She was against me going to the war zones. And there was a lot of like arguments around that. But at the end of the day, I knew that she like wanted the best for me and she wasn't ready to lose another family member. So interestingly enough, she was like maybe one Asian parent that didn't want her kid to go to med school. <laughs> um, she actually wanted to become a dentist instead and I was like, no way, like I'm not gonna spend the rest of my life looking into people's mouth. So when I chose art history and Italian, that was kind of me rebelling against my mom. Like if I can't go to med school and do whatever I was meant to do, I'm just gonna pick a major that's like purely out of joy and interest. Um, yeah, so my, my mom, my, both of my parents were like really open-minded. I mean, like they let me like travel 40 countries when I was like, I don't know, under 15. And they were really open-minded. They were really supportive of like whatever career I wanted to choose, um, except for that one. So it wasn't hard for me to like, convince my parents that I wanted to like go into a different path, like live in another country. Um, and like some of you have that personality, like when you know you want someone, you just gotta push for it. Like it might not be the best timing, it might not be the best economic circumstance. You might feel like you have this crazy awesome idea for a startup, but you don't know how to get into it. You don't have the right like founders to join your company, but like, when you know what you wanna do, you just gotta like jump in and like bump into every corners and maybe you'll learn things slower, but you'll still get there or like at least get closer to it. So you just gotta do it. That's yeah. my motto. And my last question for you is, um, does your company have anything for international students like financially? Cause um, the struggle is real for international students paying tuition. It is 100% real. So is there anything for international students um, when it comes to like tuition and stuff like that? For international students? Yes. No, so the product is open for any college students to use, um, but you gotta have like the US checking account, savings account to really use the app. Um, so having been an international student, that is something that I really want to work on, but the way the product works is we want to fi help you figure out your like short-term relevant goals, whether it's saving for next semester's expenses, being able to buy all your textbooks, buying a new laptop, studying abroad, or like going to a summer break with your friends. Um, but the real deal is like when you connect your bank accounts and we're able to analyze your spending habits to give you actionable steps on how to reach that goal, whether it's spending less on Uber this month, spending less on eating out this week. So in order for us to do that, 
we need to have your like transaction history to like learn your spending habits and be able to give you that actionable step. So as long as like whether you're an international student or not, like we don't have like separate um, resources for you right now. But if you have U.S. bank accounts, you can still use the app that way. Unfortunately, we are out of time. Uh, let's give a big hand for our panelists. Are you guys willing to stick around for a few minutes afterwards? So if you have questions, they're gonna hang out. Uh, pizza's right through the door. And uh, we'll do it again next month. See you then. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. That's so weird. They were...